Well, they say the number one thing Americans should never talk about to continue a conversation with anyone is religion or politics. <laughs> Lucky for you, today we're going to be talking about religion and one of the most radioactive political conversations that are out there, immigration. Now, uh, I know when that word popped up on the screen, everybody in their minds has something. Here we go. All right. Uh, it's not going to be that. Okay. So just hear me out with it. Uh, walk through. We are going to see what the Bible says about uh, immigration and being resident aliens or sojourners. So I promise you just bear, bear with me, be with me, and we're going to have a great time this morning. For those that don't know, my name is Chris Phillips. I'm the pastor here at Journey Point. Uh, I, I am so thankful to have Hunter here. And I just want to give him just a praise to say thank you, Hunter, for doing what you're doing. So give him a hand. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, it's really... It's really nice. For those that are new, uh, Hunter joined us about a month and a half ago as our, our full-time uh, worship leader. And so it's just nice to have somebody that is handling those things and really takes a lot of uh, thought, effort, energy, and prayer into the songs that come uh, to you guys on Sunday morning and how they tie into the messages that we're speaking. So I'm really just grateful uh, to have him. And those that are also new or are coming in a little bit later, we're collecting Connect cards. So those Connect cards in your seat, uh, we're giving to a backpack drive. So there's a box in the back of the room. Uh, so every Connect card that is also filled out again today, uh, we are going to take those Connect cards and we are going to give $5, Journey Point is, towards the backpack drive. And we're going to give those to a ton of different schools in and around the area. One of the main focus schools that we have is Green Valley Ranch. They're at about 90% free and reduced lunch. And so we were trying to provide supplies and things for those students that go to Green Valley Ranch, which is just 10 minutes down the road from us. Uh, and so make sure during the service that you fill out one of those Connect cards. And when we collect those at the end of the service, we're giving $5 to everyone. Even if you're, you did it last week, the th week before, we are still giving those. And so make sure that you do that. So, uh, you know, about six to eight weeks ago, our team was sitting in a Starbucks. And we were thinking about the messages that we were having this fall and how we were doing it. And we knew that we were in the What Does the Bible Say series. And so... We just said, okay, let's just walk around Starbucks and ask people what they are interested in knowing what the Bible says about blank. And so we got things like social justice. We got things like judgmental attitudes. We got things like sex. And we got a ton of things on immigration. And what does the Bible actually say about it? And so today we're just tackling headfirst what the Bible says about this vitriolic issue that is in our culture today that we see that is going on uh, in and around the borders and places and stuff that is in the news if you spend any time watching the news. I mean, there, there literally may be no more heated political topic right now in today than immigration. And so uh, many, though, even though it is heated, uh, many, though, even though it's there, remain quiet on the issue, including a lot of churches and or pastors. And there's reason for that. Uh, there's reasons to stay quiet on it. You don't want to offend people and walk through and, and hurt what's going on in that situation. And quite frankly, on the flip side, we see so many churches that do talk about it. And I'm not quite so sure that they're pulling from the lens of the Bible when they're talking about it either. And so you see the other side of that equation. Do you know this? 7% of adults right now would consider... Uh, their position on immigration and say that religion has any importance in that position on it at all whatsoever. So it's all Americans, the 7%. So I was researching and said, okay, what about just evangelicals, people that obviously try to adhere to the Bible and look through the lens of scripture? What about them? Only 12% of evangelicals say the issue or see the issue through the lens of their faith. And on top of that, one in four churchgoers say that they have never heard anything mentioned on the topic whatsoever in their places of worship. And so it's just not there at all. So some of you may be saying, you're sitting there going, hey, man, stay in your lane, bro. Like, just stay in your lane, bro. Like, what does religion have to do with immigration? I get it. I really do. Uh, some may think that pastors need to keep their mouth shut and not talk about the topic. And I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you on most pastors. But some would say, hey, if this is one of the most important topics in our culture today, I would really love to look through the lens of the Bible and see if I can have an educated position on it and not just let news and mainstream media and politics and culture inform and educate my opinion. Uh, and so let's also be honest, kind of uh, address the elephant in the room. Uh, a lot of pastors, in my opinion, are kind of wary of talking about it because they don't want to offend anybody. And, and so they just stay quiet. Uh, and that is a very good stance to take as well. But sometimes there are things that are hard to talk about. And if, 
if we don't see it and talk about it through the lens of the Bible, well, then I'm, I'm worried more about keeping people happy than I am just teaching the Bible. Uh, and I'm always concerned with keeping people happy for sure, but I'm way more concerned about teaching the Bible to the people that God brings. And so uh, some, that's, that's just the stance that, that we're taking. Uh, also, some avoid the topic because uh, statistically about a third uh, of the immigrants in the U.S. Are, are unlawfully immigrants in the U.S. And so when you do talk about it at all, there's an immediate thrown uh, notion over here that it comes across as judgmental or comes across as harsh. Uh, and I get that as well. But only if you let your opinions influence that and not walk through what the Bible actually says. And so here's my goal today. My goal is to just take this and read it and see what it says, not have opinions influence this one way or the other, and to give what God says about the resident aliens, the sojourners, or the immigrants, as the words are originally translated through, to say, okay, God, what do you say in this? And let that inform and educate our opinions more than news and culture and politics. And so last week, like I said, I mean, here's what we're doing. We're defining our terms, not our opponents. Don't let that slide. Define your terms, not your opponents. And hey, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's extremely important in the state of Colorado and in the city of Denver. Uh, some of you may or may not know, but uh, Colorado is one of seven sanctuary states. Uh, so there are seven sanctuary states in the U.S. And basically what that means is the state has taken the position that we are only going to do minimal work with immigration enforcement agencies so that we can care for the immigrants to the best of our ability, the ones that are fleeing for living and fleeing for terrible living situations. So they'll do the bare minimum uh, with immig immigration enforcement agencies. And so those are the sanctuary uh, states. And hey, how about this? What does immigration mean to the state of Colorado? I was fascinated by some study that I did this week. Uh, according to the 2017 American Immigration Council, immigrants make up about 9.8% of Colorado's overall population. Uh, out of that, one in 10 self-employed business owners in the state of Colorado is an immigrant, and they total about $826 million in revenue. Uh, nearly 40% are naturalized U.S. citizen, and they represent $10 billion in spending power in the state of Colorado. Uh, and then out of all of that, one out of every nine people in Colorado's labor force is an immigrant. How about this? Did you know that Denver was actually founded by 15% of people that were foreign-born people to the state of Colorado? Uh, many came out for the gold rush. So they came out for the gold rush. They struck out. They didn't do really good doing it. And so they just stayed around to found Denver in the mid-1850s. Uh, and what's even funny is Denver is known, even today, as a super entrepreneurial city. And a lot of that started in the mid-1800s with the foreign-born workers that stayed around to found Denver in the late 1850s. Uh, the state's wealthiest person at the start of the 20th century was a guy by the name of Charles Botcher. Now, Charles Botcher was a pioneering industrialist and even today is known as one of the city's greatest philanthropists. Uh, if you go around the city, there are concert halls, uh, there are other buildings across the city, and there are scholarships that are all throughout the city of Denver that are in his namesake because of the philanthropy that he did. Or how about this? John Mullen also founded the city's largest and most profitable flour mill, uh, back in that time as well, and much like Botcher, he ultimately spent much, much of his fortune on libraries, buildings, churches, and other buildings for public use for the city. Uh, attorney Thomas Patterson, who was also from Ireland like Mullen, was Colorado's first U.S. congressman and later served in Senate. German immigrants, this may resonate with some of you, German immigrants Adolf Coors and Adolf Zane became beer brewing giants here in Colorado and obviously have a headquarters in Golden. Uh, so it's a very rich history of foreign born workers that have made Colorado what it is today, the Colorado that you and I enjoy. So why am I talking about this question and answering this question? Well, number one, I think it's extremely important to God. And number two, I think it's extremely important to the city of Denver and to the state of Colorado. 
which means that it should be a really big deal to you and I, and that I should take a lens of scripture to look at it and not be informed otherwise in other areas. So lastly, one of the biggest reasons for me, uh, if one of the last things that Jesus said while he was on earth was what we call the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and he says to go and make disciples of all nations, and if we think about it, the nations are now coming to our doorsteps. I just don't think it's by accident that God has placed this here. And maybe that is our opportunity to point the nations on a journey with Jesus. And so I think it is extremely important for us to look at that. So here's what I'd love to do. I'm going to pray. And then we are just going to take a look at some of the passages in the Bible that deal with this very vitriolic, very hard topic to talk about and walk through. So pray with me. Lord. We thank you as we look to your Bible, as we look to what we call your word, God, I thank you that you give us guidance even on extremely hard topics to talk about. Uh, Lord, I thank you that every single person that we have come across today, yesterday, tomorrow, and in the future was made in the image of God. Father, and that we get to celebrate that, Lord, that you made them in your image and that we should love them as people made in your image. God, use your word today to just encourage in us and give us informed, educated, Lord, stances by according to what your Bible says, and nothing more and nothing less. We love you and praise you, and it's in your name. Amen. So today is going to be just a hair different, just a hair. Uh, so we're actually going to look at a ton of passages in the Bible, and so we're going to take a look at them. Usually we kind of park it in one passage, expound it a little bit, and then apply it to our lives. But today we're going to look at several passages, and so I'll have this... Uh, and I'll try to help you. We'll have all the verses that are going to be on the screen. Uh, but sometimes when we look to the Bible about what it says about something, there's not a particular passage that says, hey, turn to page 942, and in there you'll find out how to do this. Sometimes you have to look at the 30,000-foot view of Scripture and look at the common threads that run in there to say, oh, okay, I see what you're saying here, God, and I'm going to use this to inform uh, my opinions and my stances on things. And that's what we're doing today. So when we look at immigration and the ramifications of this in our lives as followers of Jesus, we need to ask, first and foremost, is it even mentioned in the Bible? Is there anything in the Bible that mentions this topic whatsoever? Uh, and the answer to that is, absolutely. There, there's a ton, actually, in the Bible on it. And in the Old Testament, we'll see words like foreigner, sojourner, or resident alien. Uh, and by the way, for the recent news about Area 51, when I say resident alien, I don't mean Area 51 type stuff. I, I do mean foreigners and those types of things. You see, in the original language, these words actually meant, I know it's a shock, but foreigner uh, or stranger or a person living out of his own country. Uh, in fact, the word is used about a hundred times in the Old Testament, uh, and there is a strong uh, congruence and, and ability to look at that and say it is the same word as the word immigrant that we use and see used today. Uh, most often, the word is used in a very positive sense. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when God uses it the most in and throughout the Old Testament, he is actually talking to the Israelite people, his people, uh, who were at one time not in their own country. So they were foreigners, they were sojourners, they were immigrants. And what he did was he looked at them and said, hey, I want you to treat those same people that you come across now as what he calls the native born. Uh, and so turn with me, uh, just the first passage is on page 103, uh, and it's in Leviticus 19, and verse 34. And by the way, uh, the black Bible is scattered throughout the room. If you don't own a copy of the Bible, that one's yours. Take it, keep it. We would love for you to have it. Uh, but this verse is Leviticus 19, 34, and here's what God is saying. He said, you will regard the alien or immigrant, who resides with you as the native born among you. You are to love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. <laughs> so what we see here is we have God saying, hey, bro, don't get up in arms about these people that are coming into now the land that I have given you, because if you do, you have quickly forgotten that you too were foreigners in another land and did not have a home. Remember when I took you out of Egypt? And so if you're familiar with the Bible, or maybe you're not familiar with the Bible, there's a story that uh, culminates in the, uh, the last part of the first book of the Bible in Genesis. Uh, and basically what happens is uh, starvation and famine comes to the land that the Israelite people are in. 
And when they do so, they, they had to actually flee to Egypt because that was where all the food was. And so they went there and they earned their food by their labor, which ultimately ended up in enslavement for their food and living and land because of the famine that was going on, which ultimately ended up to them being beaten and enslaved and even killed at times, right? And so they have, were removed from their land and they were immigrants in the land of Egypt and treated very, very, very poorly. Uh, in fact, God's people were actually nomadic for a really long time and they became immigrants for a long time until they landed in the land that God called their own. So in the passage that we just read in Leviticus, this is God giving his law to his people. At this time, he's giving the law to them. And, and now they're in their own land. They're kind of in, informing what's going to happen, what's going on in the land. And, and he's telling them that, hey, man, as other people come in, don't forget where you were and who you were. Treat these people as native born to the land that I have now given you. He told them to do things like they should have fair treatment as laborers. They should have fair treatment to be able to rest. They should have fair treatment and efficient payment for their labor, just as the native-born workers were. You see, throughout the Old Testament, when we see these words that are referenced as immigrants, we see them coupled alongside of the fatherless and alongside of the widows. Therefore, God in these is saying, hey, these are a people that are to be cared for, and these are a people that are to be provided for, and they are a very vulnerable people, so you should make sure that you do what you can in those areas. Check a couple of verses out with me here. Here's what it says, Psalms 146.9, it'll be on the screen. It says, the Lord protects resident aliens or immigrants and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Zechariah 7.10 it says this, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the resident alien or the poor, and do not plot evil in your hearts against one another. Malachi 3, 5, I will come to you in judgment and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker, the widow and the fatherless, and against those who deny justice to the resident alien. They do not fear me, says the Lord of armies. Jeremiah 7, 6, it says, if you no longer oppress the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, and no longer shed innocent blood in this place or follow other gods, bringing harm on yourselves, I will allow you to live in this place. Deuteronomy 24, 21, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. What remains will be for the resident alien, the fatherless, the widow. Last one, Exodus 23, 9 says, you shall not oppress the sojourner, the resident alien, the poor. You should, you know the heart of them, for you were once one of them in the land of Egypt. See, God is saying in all of this, two things to us about the resident alien or the sojourner or the foreigner or the immigrant. The first thing he's saying is that God loves them. There is no question. God loves them. And the reason he loves them is because they were made in his image. Every single last one of them. And so God is saying, hey, don't, don't you dare forget. I love them. And then the second thing he's saying is, hey, your history as immigrants should also inform the way that you react or respond to the foreigners in your own land. You cannot forget, it's hard for us to forget our history. And God is saying, I love them and do not forget. For you were brought out of similar situations. Now, you and I today are not Israelite people that are fleeing to Egypt and all of those things that we see in the Bible. Uh, but uh, maybe some of us don't even have a history of being a foreigner or being a sojourner in our lives at all, although our ancestors do. And some of us, that is very near and real to us. But I guarantee you this, every single one of us here today are made in the image of God. Every last one of us are made in the image of God. And God's love for his people in his image is unchanging. It has never changed. There is, I mean, no matter the foreigner, no matter the sojourner, no matter the immigrant, God's love for his people never changes. 
And that should guide our response first and foremost in everything that we do, right? God's love for all people made in his image, regardless of status, is unchanging. All people, regardless, unchanging. And when we look at the life of Jesus and then move into the New Testament, we actually quickly find that Jesus was also a resident alien himself. If you turn to the first book of the New Testament in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, this is what it says. This is God speaking to Jesus' dad. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and they escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets might be fulfilled. Don't miss that. What was spoken by the Lord through the prophets would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I call my son. Don't miss this. God's plan and prophecy for Jesus was for him to be an immigrant. God's plan and prophecy for Jesus in the Old Testament was for Jesus to be a resident alien. And I know what you may be thinking, hey man, fleeing death is not something that many of us in the United States can even wrap our minds around. That is not something we are accustomed to, that is not something that is natural to us. But I'll just tell you this, it is a very real scenario in 2019 across the world. Uh, the top reasons that people flee the area called the Northern Triangle. So the Northern Triangle is made up of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, right? So the top reasons that people flee the Northern Triangle part of uh, that country is, are these three things. Number one, fleeing violence in their community and or their home. Now, we have crime in certain cities in the U.S., but take a load of these statistics. El Salvador, the Northern Triangle has the highest homicide rate in the world. World. They were killing 103 people per 100,000 people. That's how they categorize the statistics, per 100,000. And theirs was the highest at 103 homicides per 100,000, and at one point registering 53 homicides per year. It was the highest in the world. On that list also at number five was Honduras. Coming in at number 16 was Guatemala. In the world, they're fleeing violence in their community and their home. Number two, they are actively avoiding recruitment into gangs. Did you know that 90% of the documented cocaine that comes to the United States comes through the Northern Triangle? Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, 90% of the documented cocaine comes through there. They're actively grabbing children into these gangs and initiating them early, and they are entrapped, enslaved. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I'm wearing this shirt today is because I, I bought it several months ago, and, and I had it, and I thought about it last night. Uh, the X stands for an end it movement, and it's talking about slavery that's happening all throughout the world. Child slavery, number one, and then uh, sex trafficking, number two. Uh, and so this X, you'll see certain parts of the year, people will write Xs on their hands, and they put it out there. And it's to stand for the fight to end slavery across the world. And, and many of these people are fleeing because of those reasons. As a matter of fact, that ties into the third point of the reason people are fleeing. It's because they're avoiding exploitation in the form of prostitution or human trafficking. From 2007 to 2012 in Honduras, uh, they had the highest female homicide rate in the world uh, because of sex trafficking and those types of issues that were going on. I am so glad that when Jesus fled, he was loved and he was cared for. I am so glad he was able to live his 33 years so that he could take my place and so that I could have a right relationship with God because he was loved and cared for as he had to flee. If you take away one thing today, I think the biggest thing I'd love you to take away from is we just need to engage. Uh, and sometimes I think the greatest thing that can help us in any of these conversations is just to engage with somebody that's not like us. Now, that's in general for business or whatever else. We always learn from people that are not like us. You'd never learn from people that are just like you. But even more so in this conversation, because it's like maybe I just need to have a conversation with somebody that has this background or history or whatever it may be that is not like my background and history with it. And the one encouragement I would give you this week is to just engage. We have 
countless opportunities in Colorado and in the city of Denver and even Stapleton and North Aurora to engage. And if you would just engage, I guarantee that you will learn something you did not know and that God would move in and through you in a way that he maybe had not before on this topic. You see, the Bible calls us to a higher calling in life. We are to love. We are to welcome. We are to seek justice for our neighbors. We are to love. We are to comfort. We are to seek justice for those that are made in the image of God. We are to be involved while adhering to God's commands the best that we can. And, and, and then that kind of, that God's commands brings in the other side of the equation. So when we bring in this other side of the equation, a lot of people uh, will bring in a verse out of the Bible uh, when talking about adhering to policies and things that we have now for the immigration system. Uh, so they'll bring in Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. As a matter of fact, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions last year when talking about immigration policies brings up Romans 13, 1 and 2. Uh, and just, just to pause for a second, I wish uh, when politics want, uh, politicians want to speak about the Bible in certain settings, they would just pause and breathe and then not, right? Because it makes it so much harder to engage with people and to point them on a journey with Jesus when this is what they hear in the news, right? And so it's not a negative component, but it may not be exactly used 100% effectively. And here's what Romans 13, 1 and 2 says. It says, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's commands. And that verse and that book and that chapter is 100% accurate. There is nothing not accurate about that verse. But I do think we have to contextually look at a couple of things. Listen, I am a systems and process guy of all systems and process people. Uh, if you talk to my wife, she would tell you that I have a process and a system in place for everything. Uh, when we go on vacation, our life is miserable because I have planned every minute of every hour of every day in our vacation so that we can make the most of it. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't have a process then, then, and you're not enforcing it and you're not doing it, then there is no process, right? And so some would joke, say that, I mean, I've had a guy before, he's like, man, intimacy in your house is probably even processed out to certain days and, and times. And I'm like, no, no, it's not a bad idea. Um, and so, no, I'm just kidding, joking. Uh, so when we take a look at the system that we have currently in the United States, we have to at some point look at and thank, first and foremost, in my opinion, the officers and people that are doing the job that God has called them to do. Uh, there are processes that are there and there are uh, officials and border patrol people and ICE people that are doing the job that God has called them to do. And sometimes we don't just say, thank you for doing what God called you to do, no matter whether you agree or disagree with it, right? Uh, and so when we do that, uh, there's a picture of this. Sometimes this doesn't get thrown up there. Uh, just a, a few weeks ago, there was a seven-year-old boy that was crossing the Rio Grande River, and as he was crossing, he was drowning to death, and he was saved by Border Patrol people that were out there. Uh, in fact, Border Patrol uh, gets calls on 4,300 emergencies per year that honestly result in 283 deaths. And so I don't know statistically what's good and what's bad, but they're doing a really good job of protecting the other 4,000 people. And sometimes we just need to say thank you for doing what it is that God has called you to do. But I have to say this, if the overall system from a 30,000 foot view is cracked or is broken, then we have to take a step back and go, okay, what's wrong and what can we do? You see, our, our lives are not solely a process. I can't process everything out. We also have to show and submit and examine the love in our life. You see, Christians are called and commanded and need to respect the government, says Paul. But this does not mean just legitimizing everything that they do just because that they do it. Uh, in fact, there are many other passages in the Bible where God actually approves Christians disobeying the government, but only when Christian obedience means disobedience to God. So God approves disobeying when, dis, uh, when obeying whatever it is means that I'm disobeying God. God is first and foremost, 100% every single bit of the time. Uh, in the book of Daniel, there is a story about a guy named Daniel, and he is called by governing authorities to submit and bow down and pray to a statue, and he does not do it. And, and God is perfectly fine by him not doing that and adhering to Romans 13 because that's not what he's called to do by God first. Or... 
What about Joseph that we just read? Joseph flees, should not have, by governing authorities. But I'm grateful that he did because Jesus was able to live and not be murdered by Herod's attempt to get rid of the king that was coming. Or in some cases, it just means that we need to love our neighbor and love people made in the image of God. You see, and here's the way that that U.S. citizens in the United States can uh, have a right to disagree with government. There are several ways that we can do it. Number one, in the ballot box. So we have to be involved and be engaged in in those areas that that you feel passionate about. We can do it through publications, online or social media or whatever that may be. We can do it by organizing educational, legal, or civic organizations that defend other points of view that may not uh, be promoted as highly as the one that is there. And we can do it by promoting a peaceful protest. There has been a lot that has been accomplished by peaceful protest. I am from the city of Memphis, and the sanitation worker strike and Martin Luther King is a huge part of the city and culture that I grew up in. And, and so peaceful protests can go and make change. And here's the deal. The other thing is if you remember anything today, the best way... The 100% best way to care for those in the system is to be involved in the system. You know, even in your workplaces and in your lives, you don't have as much respect for people that come giving you opinions if they're not involved in what is going on. And so the best way to care for those that are in the system are first and foremost to be involved in the system. You see, each of these ways that I mentioned is a way to express reservations about what is going on. Uh, and what is being mandated, and, and see, immigration is such a, a clear picture of the disagreement that we have in the country, but be involved to have an educated opinion. And think about this. Think about this this week. There is not a whole lot that uh, our capital of the country agrees on uh, in terms of all the people that live there. There's not a whole lot that they agree on, but the one thing that they do agree on is that with this particular topic, we are not where we need to be. Everybody there for the most part, agrees on that, that we are not where we need to be. And and so if these laws and these things are problematic, both theologically, both humanely, both pragmatically, then we have to step back and go, what can we do to begin working towards a new standard procedure here that will help everybody on both sides? You see, ideally, laws should embody the best moral principles of the nation. And when we see that we are standing here with nobody agreeing and everybody agreeing that something needs to be done, clearly what we have in place is not for the best needs of the nation. Now, let me ask you this. The skeptic in the room may be asking this question, okay? Because I've heard it. I heard it this week when having some conversation. Uh, which, by the way, yet again, I asked last week about social justice. People were like, ooh. I talked about, people said, hey, what are we teaching on this week? Immigration? Mm. Like, like, what in the world, Chris? What are you doing, you know? Uh, but when we take a step back and look at it, some people are saying, well, what about the people that are uh, unnaturally and unlawfully coming in that are Christians? Aren't they knowingly and, and identifying themselves and saying, I'm going to disagree with this. I'm going to unlawfully do whatever. Shouldn't there be something there? What about that question? Well, I, I think so, that we have to at least look at that and examine that. But I would also ask this question. Haven't they also experiences, experienced the law's iniquities also? Uh, so even though the law is there, haven't they experienced the iniquities? For example, I was doing some research this week, and, and a lot of times in certain situations, there's huge gaps and holes where the government kind of turns a little bit of a blind, a blind eye to many employers because the country wants and needs labor in the U.S. But then it makes access to certain things harder for one set of workers than it does for another set of workers. What I have found in having conversations and real life conversations with this is that immigrants admire the efficiency of the legal system in the U.S. They 100% do. They actually want to contribute to society the best they can, even as they work for a better life. Many do their best to obey the laws that are in every area that do not threaten their jobs or their homes or their children's education and welfare. Many, if not all, desire to be model citizens as part of the Christian duty in order to gain the much-needed respect of the culture in which they live in. They really do. And all fervently want a fair legal system for all parties involved so that they could be treated as the native-born also. So what do we do as followers of Jesus? How do we respond? I think first, we must define 
our terms and not our opponents. If you walk away with anything, define your terms and not your opponents. You see, our primary goal in everything, in any situation, is to love everyone made in the image of God. Care for them and treat them as you desire to be treated. And then on the other part of that, we should respect the system and situation that is there. And now respect doesn't mean blindly adhering to or walking blindly into and not disagreeing with, right? I mean, like, I can respectfully disagree with those people that think that chicken nuggets are better than chicken strips. I can just respectfully disagree. It doesn't mean they're right. I can disrespectfully, I mean, I can respectfully disagree. I can disagree with the people that think the Dodgers are the team to root for when we have the Rockies here, and I just can't stand the Dodgers. I can respectfully disagree with people. It doesn't mean that I can't walk in and respectfully disagree. But see, our question as followers of Jesus should not first be, are we allowing illegal entry? What are we doing? I think our very first question should be, are we welcoming the stranger? Am I welcoming the person made in the image of God? You see, faithful Christians cannot see immigrant neighbors as an intrusion into their way of life. But I think we ought to see it as a God-given opportunity to be Jesus expressed from the church to the world. And, and if I'm being honest, before I had conversations with people that were caught up in these situations, I may have just been uninformed and like, eh, whatever. When you have a conversation with somebody that was made in God's image, it will 100% change your outlook and your approach to the entire situation. You see, the immigrant is either arriving as one of two people, and this is one of two people that you ever come in contact with. They are either fellow followers of Jesus, or they are somebody that needs to take a journey with Jesus. There's no way around that. That's the only two people that you will come across. And so we should treat them first and foremost as that. You, you have to understand this. Never forget this. Immigration is not a problem to be solved, but it is a people for whom Jesus died. It is a people for whom Jesus died. That should be our first and primary response, no matter what else we think. But to find someone that is not from our same background and engage with them and show them the love that Jesus would show them. You see, I fully believe that without a biblical approach to this conversation, we can view it as a threat and as an invasion and whatever you want to throw out there rather than an intentional gospel opportunity. You see, if we teach Jesus and we talk about Jesus, then we need to show Jesus. So today, instead of saying quiet or maybe even overly vocal, neither of the two, stand, come in the middle here. Why don't we shape the national conversation as followers of Jesus? Why don't we shape the conversation that is going on as loving those people made in the image of God? We've got to move ahead towards constructive change within the rights of Christian humility and charity with respect for those that are placed in authority, 100%. But especially with an eye to the higher calling that we have as people of God to be light in a very dark world. That should influence everything we have. And we must never forget that ultimately, as followers of Jesus, our primary citizenship is not on earth. You see, one day we will be in a kingdom of God. For those that believe, we will stand in the presence of God, not with a citizenship on earth, but with a citizenship in heaven. We have that because Jesus, a resident alien, fleeing for his life, was able to do so and then live 33 years after that so that he could take our place. So that he could live a perfect life and take the place of the imperfect life that we live. So that he could later on be beaten and battered murdered on a cross and then risen again and he did that and he did that to take our place 
And, and so that if we believe in that, if we trust in that, and we say, I'm living by his leadership, then we have a citizenship in a place that is far more greater than anything you can even possibly experience in Denver, Colorado, or the United States, or this world on earth. There is no question about that. And so this week, find someone that you can love that was made in the image of God. And just love them supremely. Care for them. Hear their story. Find out what it is that makes them passionate and what they love. Find that person. And, and then respect the system by being involved in the system. Somehow, some way, whatever it is that God puts on your heart to be passionate about. <laughs>